Lewis Gordon, the founding member of the Institute of the Study for Race and Social Thought at Temple University, has called him passionate, provocative, evocative, insightful, and always truthful. His work stands as one of the best examples of prophetic criticism that speaks not only to and from the contem contemporary Africana experience, but to anyone interested in the same struggle for human liberation. Please, let's give it up for a more. Quaker himself 
born in 1912, right here in Westchester. He grew up with his grandparents. Openly gay at the time in America, as if it's cool to be openly gay today. Uh, but certainly then, you know, we can imagine the kind of strife someone like Rustin may have had to confront and deal with. He had a loving grandmother who embraced him as he was. And I imagine it was because of that foundation of love that he was able to become the man that he became. Rustin was a dynamic individual in his own right. In the times in which we live, when we talk about questions of the economy, and I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the economy today, what type of system we ought to have in place, Rustin was at the forefront of all of that. He joined in 1927, the Young Communist League, for a period. In 1941, he joined the Socialist Fellowship of Reconciliation. In 1944, he was arrested and jailed as a conscientious objector in resistance to the war draft. In 1953, he was arrested for, quote, sexual perversion, having sex in a car in California. Rustin would go on to work with A. Philip Randolph, the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was a union of black porters in this country. In 1941, Randolph threatened FDR with a march on Washington to desegregate the armed forces. It was that mentorship that enabled Rustin to become the mentor he would be for Dr. King. Dr. King was a very charismatic speaker, but his organizing skills, well, you know, you know Dr. King was in his 20s, so when he became the leader of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. So just think about that. Many of you are in your 20s, maybe a few years younger than Dr. King was in the age of 25. He's the one in the basement. They said, you're going to be the one to lead us up out of this. So yeah, King didn't have a lot of on-the-ground experience. Um, you know, but he, he talked to it. And for the folks, that, that mattered plenty. So we, folks like Rustin will come along and give King some guidance. With the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In 1960, ahead of the Democratic National Convention at that time, SELC had planned a protest march against the Democratic Party. Um, Democratic Party then is not the Democratic Party of today. You had folks in the Democratic Party who were called Dixocrats. These were Southern segregations. And so King and his folks were interested in trying to put some pressure on the Democratic Party to uh, address itself to its own racism. Well, you know, think about what's going on in Virginia right now. The Democrats got some cleaning up yet. But it was that proposed march that actual <coughs> Democratic officials threatened SELC with exposing Rustin and his sexuality. And they were a little threatened by it. And in fact, relieved Rustin officially of his position in the organization as a consequence. Rustin, in his reflection, you can you know, Google this and, and listen to Rustin himself in the, in the 80s, reflect on this experience, and he said it was very painful. Knowledge. And folks he had worked with, been in fellowship with, considered brothers with, kind of shunned him, distanced himself from him because of his identity. There's a real lesson there for us today when we think about the work that we're doing as activists, as student activists, as community activists. Here, the point is that we need all of us. No one is throw away. No one is marginal. Uh, and 
then if we think that, then the problem is ours, not the individual, not the person or the group. A few years later, they would bring, they would correct themselves. SELC would fix their position. And it was, it was out of need. Between 1960 and 1962, SELC's work in trying to organize and lift up the concerns of black folk in the South uh, wasn't meeting with much success. And so they were looking around and saying, okay, what seems to be the problem? And the missing uh, concern was, Rustin's not around. So they brought Rustin back in and um, began to plan the March on Washington. That's what we know it as. But the March on Washington was actually called the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice. And that was Rustin's conception. See, Rustin was a labor activist. His history with A. Philip Randolph in particular, as well as the other organizations I mentioned, prioritized the need for allowing activist social justice work to be directed by workers and the concerns of workers. What Rustin recognized was that with all the concerns around citizenship questions for the African American community, at the base of that concern was the concern for employment the rights of workers, black workers. So they began to organize the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice, and you know, once again, politicians, doing what politicians do, try to attack the movement. But this time it would be South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond. Now, you know, if that name doesn't ring a bell to you, you know, I highly encourage you to, to Google Strom Thurmond just to get a sense of, we think Trump's bad. Trump's not new. Ain't nothing new about Trump whatsoever. Strom Thurmond went on public television and accused Rustin of being a communist draft dodging homosexual in the effort to disparage the March on Washington. Thurman's attack actually backfired and leaders of the movement rallied around Rustin and moved forward to organize a march that would lead to the development of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act just a year or two later. Acts that would in fact of course change the course of American history. We are living today at a time where the need for change in the course of American history is high. As I said, like Strom Thurmond and his attack on Mayor Rustin, we have a president in Trump that has attacked practically every group in this nation. He is an offense to anyone who isn't themselves white, rich, male, and heterosexual and able-bodied. Whether through his rhetoric, his rallies, or his executive actions, he is a walking hate crime. Lately, we have seen more and more Democrats come out you know, calling him what he is, a racist. What I always say is, yeah, and water is wet. <laughs> we have to have a deeper understanding of the hatred that we're facing. single out Trump as a racist does absolutely nothing to help us address the reason why a Trump exists and even more a reason why a President Trump exists. We need to have an analysis that is not about individuals but an analysis that is institutional. What does Trump represent? I believe that Trump represents the bald face of capitalism. Given 
Rustin's analysis, given Rustin's background and experience, it is in that spirit I'm going to share these comments with you. Critique of the system of capitalism in our day is, again, that's not anything new. We have congresspersons who are challenging our current economic structure. We have presidential candidates challenging our current economic structure. <laughs> Trump's version of masculinity is also a need of being critiqued. But once again, Trump didn't invent any of this. That if we are to be honest, masculinity that is unchecked has the potential to be what we call and understand toxic masculinity. There are mass shootings that occur in this country all the time. We hear about them on occasion when the body count is considerable or when there's school children involved. But a mass shooting is a shooting in which at least four persons are shot by a single person. There are mass shootings that occur in this country monthly. You cannot understand the psychology of the average mass shooter without understanding toxic masculinity. You can't understand toxic masculinity in our day without having an understanding of conception of masculinity that occurs all across this country and has been heralded by the highest political office in this nation. We are in this the season of the Me Too movement. With all the important work that that movement is doing, we must be willing to acknowledge a few things. That until the Me Too movement is centered in the lives of the most oppressed women, namely indigenous women in this country and in Canada, and the lives of African American women across this country. In 2014, there was a report that made the round indicating that upwards of 64,000 black women in this country are missing. 64,000. In 2016, the National Crime Information Center reported that there were 5,712 reports of slain or missing Native American women and girls. That's the reality that we're faced with. That's just a statistic, but that statistic speaks to the levels of vulnerability and exploitation that exist in this country still for majority women of color. I am pleased to see that R. Kelly is finally getting what's due to Over two decades of allegations, we can only hope that something close to justice will finally be experienced for the survivors and the victims and their families. In 2006, I wrote and published a book called Misogyny in the MC, in which I wrote an essay on R. Kelly. At the time, it was the only such book written by a heterosexual black man challenging what is clear exploitation of black women in hip hop culture. See, it doesn't take one to be a member of the group 
in order to take a stand and just say what is the truth. And to hold oneself accountable to that truth. I'm encouraging us to consider the kind of work that we need to be doing today. But when we prioritize and protect the lives and reputations of one individual of an oppressed group over against another oppressed group, we become participants in the repression and depression. Let's talk about the economy. The economic system in which we live is the frame for the social structure we all live in. It governs all primary areas of life. Education, quality of education, quality of employment, quality of housing, and access to the society at large, an opportunity for mobility. In all areas, quality of life, people classified as white still have levels of access that are disproportionate to their actual numbers in this country. The question of labor is crucial to addressing justice issues of identity. Rustin recognized this well. Again, as I shared earlier, it was his idea to ensure that the March on Washington was a march on Washington for jobs and justice. For those of us who position ourselves on the left, we must recognize the inaccuracy of a class first analysis. For it is an analysis that promotes a colorblind or a race neutral critique of the economy. And in this process, it helps explain why black people and other people of color, including immigrants of color, often have to look to themselves. We must turn this on its head and recognize the super exploitation of black and brown workers for what it is. This means looking first at the privileged worker, the white worker. And what makes the white worker privileged? but is in her whiteness. If race is a biological fiction, and I would hope that we all can attest to that, race is a biological fiction, but it is a social reality. Therefore, it has a function, it has a role. We must understand its social function in our world today. I'm going to read a quote from the great W.E.B. Du Bois. In the 30s, Du Bois wrote a book some people consider a magnum opus. And that's saying much because, you know, Du Bois, Du Bois left the library for it. He wrote in the 1930s a book entitled Black Reconstruction where he gives a historic view and a social analysis of the period following the Civil War that decade that we call the Reconstruction. I'm going to read a quote from the boys, from that book written in the 1930s, and I want you to think about the world in which we live in today with respect to whiteness. And blackness. He's developing this concept that he calls the psychological wage of whiteness. He says, the, the white group of laborers, while they receive the lowly, he's talking about the white poor, during the Reconstruction, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of courtesy because they were white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn from their ranks, and the courts, depending on their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. Their votes elected public officials, and while this had small effect on their economic situation, it had great effect on their personal treatment and the deference shown them. 
White schoolhouses were the best in the community and conspicuously placed. And they cost anywhere from twice to ten times as much per capita as the colored schools. The newspaper specialized on news that flattered the poor whites and almost utterly ignored the Negro accepting crime and ridicule. And he goes on to say, the result of this was that the wages of both classes could be kept low, the whites fearing to be supplanted by the Negro labor, the Negroes always being threatened by the substitution of white labor. In my workshops that I do on race, we go through the background of this story to show that before this nation was a nation, when it was still yet a colony of the British, throughout plantations in the South, black, what would become black and white workers worked the plantations the same. But over time, and it didn't take much time, colonial rulers began to recognize and make some changes in the laws that brought about the development of chattel slavery and brought about an opportunity for the removal of white people from the status of indenture. Those laws, that dynamic that was placed, that drove a wedge between folks who class-wise had everything in common, remains true to this day. When we see the folks who show up at a Trump rally wearing Make America Great Again hats, whose lot in life ain't changed one bit, ain't going to change, yet will rally for a man who never labored in his entire life. don't know the meaning of hard work. Yet somehow they believe they have more in common with him than they do their black and brown fellows across this nation who strive and struggle and work hard every day. But that's telling. That's saying something. And what it's saying is that throughout history, in this country anyway, the white worker has made a conscious decision. I took issue online with Bernie Sanders and others who, during this last midterm elections, tried to make room for and space for those white workers that decided to vote in the Florida uh, election for a white man following Trump's footsteps saying all manner of all things about his guy running against him who was African-American. Bernie tried to give the possibility that those white voters that voted for this guy were not racist. They were somehow duped, given the racist rhetoric. And I say, you know, don't belittle white folks like that. They know what they're doing. They know who they're voting for. And they know why. There is a clear benefit that they experience given what Du Bois spoke about back in the 30s, referencing over a century ago in this nation. I'm saying that this is the kind of truth we need to be talking to. When slavery was present, when black labor did not receive a wage, was tortured, chained, the white worker co-signed that. After slavery, during peonage, during sharecropping, white worker co-signed that too. 
And in this age of employment discrimination, where you can be a black person with a college degree and make no more in certain cases than a white person with a high school degree. The white worker coincides that too. Lyndon Baines Johnson, former president, in the 1960s said to a young Bill Moyers who was his intern in the White House, that if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. If you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. <coughs> Give him somebody to look down on, and he'll empty his pockets for you. As we look at those who voted for Trump, a capitalist capitalist. One wonders if the white worker is still being duped, or if he is or she is consciously engaged in what is the realization of their clear advantage. Their ownership of their identity as white, in poor, in a stereotyped ignorance and lack of education, championed by Yale graduate Jude G.W., makes one think that they are indeed grateful for their whiteness in spite of their poverty. Granted the ability to enact violence and take out their frustrations on black, brown, and Jewish people, they are willing to hold up the system of capitalism as it is, even positioned where they are, just above of we know how capitalism works. The owner makes a profit based on their ability to convince the worker that they don't really need to earn that much. Malcolm X once said, you can't have capitalism without racism. Therefore, to work against the negative impact of capitalism means to address race, not to ignore it. it means to commit to an anti-racist activism, even with respect to the economy. Any less than you are, in fact, betraying the workers of all races. But to look at labor and class through the lens of race means making the connection between all workers. and acknowledging the gross unemployment rates of black and indigenous people in immigrant communities of color, and the frustration that that proves. After the March on Washington, just two years later, in Watts, California, there was a rebellion. It's known in history as the Watts Riots. Black folk rebelled after an act of police brutality occurred in the community. Dr. King went to Watts. And it was a very sobering experience for him. With him was Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin, in his reflection, talked about talking to some of the young men on the streets that night, trying to get a sense of what happened in Watts. <coughs> And what he learned and what he would reflect on was the fact that at the heart of their frustration wasn't the police. It was the fact that they knew that there was no chance for them in this country. And nobody was going to hire them. Nobody was going to prepare them for the labor market. They were unemployable. So as a consequence, if they were going to survive, if they were going to make a living of something, they were going to have to get involved in the underground economy. And that is what would cause them to confront with the police. And that's what set them off. Preston then, in his reflection, said, now what most folk in the country didn't recognize was that at the time, Watts had 50% unemployment. Half the people in the community couldn't find work. Rustin then said, now imagine if that was his country. 50% in his country were not able to find work. He said they wouldn't call it a riot, they'd call it a revolution. When we look at the question of labor, when we 
look at the question of the employment in this economy, it opens up our eyes to better appreciate the dynamics that exist in communities that are aggrieved. And it helps direct our focus with respect to what we should do about it. <coughs> we listen to folks in office on both sides of the political spectrum. We would want to believe that the people trying to cross the border into this country are coming to take jobs. We live in a system. Capitalism is not just an American thing. The capitalism has the ability to go over borders while it confines workers within borders. You have organizations like the IMF that go into former colonized countries and say, listen, we understand that you're having economic trouble. We ain't gonna have a conversation about how you got into economic trouble, why you're having fiscal problems. But we're offering you a loan with the proviso. The proviso is you gotta open up your markets to our fellows. Let them come in and set up shop. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Liberated Ghana, wrote a book entitled Neo-Colonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. Because what I just described to you, that's imperialism. What happens following imperialism? What some may say is U.S. government wants to do right now in Venezuela is neo-colonialism. They want to control Trump. They want to have to go oil. So think about Trump. Right? There's no hiding in Trump. It's not a conspiracy. He said it. We went through it. Some of y'all might know that there is also rebellions going on in Haiti right now. But what most of us don't know is that there's a connection between what's happening in Haiti and what they're doing in Venezuela. It is our homework to understand those connections and the role the U.S. government is playing in all of that. So workers crossing borders have to fear violence. No different than African American and other people of color in this country who fear violence, state sanctioned violence, in the act of merely going to school and going to work. Let us remember that Sandra Bland was on her way to a new job opportunity when she was stopped that fateful day in Texas. Sandra's example of a life lived on purpose, embodying change, reflects the life of Rustin. Her commitment to justice, unquestioned. Through her uses of social media to enlighten others across the racial spectrum, and encourages all to greater activism and engagement toward real change. Rustin once said that we need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers. Our power is in our ability to make things unworkable. The only weapon we have is our bodies. And we need to tuck them in places so the wheels don't turn. All we have are our bodies. What we do with them is what matters. When we embody change, when we commit ourselves to the work of justice, wherever we are, whoever we are, we become Rustin's angelic troublemakers. The point is that we got to come together. Our differences matter, and our diversity should be respected, but they should never come at the cost of our support of each other. To do that will mean that our common oppressor will have won. And yes, we have a common oppressor. And if that's not true for you, if you look at me funny and say, what do you mean a common oppressor? Then I might have to wonder, 
if you're a part of your brain. And if you can't see that, then I highly encourage you to remove the block of your privilege from your eyes. We have to organize. Our accountability in our work must be with the least privilege. The question that we must ask in our activism is, will the intended act harm another community? If the answer is yes, then we need to rethink our strategy. We use social media today to do a lot of our mobilizing, but I just want to make the point that Twitter may have revolutionized how we communicate and connect, but it is not the revolution. A tweet is not going to free us. And as we see again by the guy in the White House, you know, can't rely on a tweet for the truth. There is no alternative to organization. We have to organize for justice, not for candidates. We should have learned that by now. It is the structure that must change, not who is in office, necessarily. The day after the election is the day we begin the real work. We must organize for access into institutions even as we organize for new structures. Our struggle is always dual. The boy said it is for democracy and self-determination. We must organize around common issues even as we support the particular struggles of our allies. We gotta position ourselves at the intersection of oppression. We have to become living embodiments of the change we seek so that we can live into the world as it should be. Our world will change when we change. I'm going to end uh, my comments with home, and then I believe we'll have a few moments for any uh, questions, comments. Again, I want to say I thank you for the opportunity to speak and share with you. Uh, I know that the day is going to be an ever enlightening experience for many of you. This is called Who's America? Who's America? We are not all capitalists. 
seeking to privatize the entire plan. Some of us are socialists and communists seeking to live simply so others can simply live. Who's America? All of us are not white. Believing this land is ours by divine right, becoming the hue of the whole of humanity. The pride we have in our people is more than skin, vanity. We remember, as the poet once said, America has never been America to me. We are redefining what it means to be still fighting the revolution to form a more perfect union. Marching to the sound of Ray Charles and Jose Feliciano singing the national anthem, their voices rapping us in the red, white, and blues of our struggle here. No, you may not recognize this land when we are through. Who's America? My country, tis of thee, from sea to shining sea. Watch us make it.